On today's show, the Dallas Mavericks are reportedly interested in Dennis Schroeder. Should they be? Why are they not currently signing him right now? They have a need. We'll talk about all that and more on today's Locked On Mavs. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks Podcast. Hey, hey, Dallas Mavericks are NBA champions. I don't believe you shouldn't be here. And welcome. You are locked on to the Dallas Mavericks. My name is Nick Engstead, media member and NBA channel manager for the Locked On Podcast Network. Thanks for making Locked On Mavs your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms, including YouTube, where the best way you can help us grow the show is to comment anything below. Give me a me Slovensi below. Give me a your team every day below. Comment any of those things. And also let me know, should the Mavericks sign Dennis Schroeder? If you weren't Nico Harrison, would you sign him right now? Give me a yes or no, and then why, why you wouldn't do it. Uh, and joining me, friend of the show, host of the Locked On NBA Big Board Show, draft expert, and just overall NBA like junkie, Richard Stamen, Mavs Draft on Twitter. Richard, what you got for me? Dude, it's uh, it's nice to be here, not talking draft. It's a little bit of a change up for me. It's a, uh, it's a little different. Recording in progress. But you have, but you have uh, a, a wide range of of NBA knowledge. I always see you like tweet. You, you like are one of the people that anytime I go on Twitter, I'm like, damn, I gotta watch more NBA games because Richard's <laughs> always tweeting about about games all the time. It's like a different game every night, and I'm like, God. He watches more games than me. It's one of those things as NBA media people we, we keep track of, like who we, who we think watches more games. We, we think about it with the takes. We think about it when we are on Twitter. It's all It all comes back. But today we're going to get into Dennis Schroeder again. We talked about him a little bit on yesterday's show, but I think it's a bigger topic because I think it, it, it stems from a couple of things with the Dallas Mavericks, and they'll tell us a couple of things about the Mavericks. How much do they want to risk? How much are they desperate enough to need somebody like Schroeder? And... What is he? <laughs> what what is he, and how do they how do they evaluate him? And that's what I think. A couple of things that the Mavericks are kind of weighing right now over in Europe, seeing him with the German national team, and trying to figure out if he's a good fit for the roster. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll get into uh, Mark Stein wrote about this, and this is the reason why we're bringing it up because Mark Stein said that the, the Mavericks are interested in him, and that there's a couple other options that they may be considering as well: Eric Bledsoe, Compazzo. Alfred Payton and maybe an old friend. So we'll talk about some of those other guard options, the Mavericks, and then the option to keep the roster spot open. So there's a bunch of different ways the Mavericks could go here. And so let's get into it. Um, Let's start with this Uh, Mavs draft, Richard Stamen. Would you sign Dennis Schroeder right now? You're the Dallas Mavericks, 15th roster spot open, knowing everything we know about Schroeder, would you, and what the Mavericks need, would you sign him? Yeah. I think if you look at the last guard on the roster, being Dennis Schroeder, I don't even think he's the worst guard on the team. And when that's your last signing, it's probably pretty good because that means you're upgrading your, what you already had in place. Like for me, I would rather have him than not only Frank Nielakina, but also somebody who's no longer on the team, pretty much who I consider him replacing the roster spot of is Trey Burke. Yeah, Major upgrades over both. You have another guard that can finally play, maybe not as good as Jalen Brunson, but you could find somebody to split those uh, minutes with, with him. And that's the thing, like you start there, right? You say, okay, if I'm just going to take it at an analytical point of view, take it as a, you know, kind of 2K where you're like, all right, what are these ratings? Who are these guys? And how how can I get the most talent on my team? Which is, as a draft person, that's how you look at things. Like, how can I get the, you know, the most talent on my team? How can I grab a guy that's going to fill need that I want or that's going to give me the type of of player that I want or the level of player that I want? And it makes sense then. So in that sense, I start to think, all right, why haven't they done this yet? Like, this is such a slam dunk. He's played with Dirk before. I know that there have been rumors that Dirk didn't like him, but I've seen other reports that they were fine and and they've been cordial back and forth. And like, I don't know. I didn't find a definitive report that says that he hated Dennis Schroeder. He was like a cancer in the locker room or anything like that. So send it to me if you've seen it because I looked for a while yesterday to try and find that. So he's had weird run-ins in the past with some of his with some of his past teams and that's where it gets complicated. It's not about it's not even necessarily about the play on the court because we know what he would bring, right? This is this is to your point. This is the the reason why you'd bring him in is he can get to the rim. I I reached out to uh the Kamenetsky brothers who host Locked on Lakers and I was just like, "Hey, give me the lowdown on Schroeder. What was he like? He started like six he started all 61 games for the the Lakers 
two years ago. He played in the playoffs for them. He started in the playoffs for them. Like it was just great. It was like a great fit for them. And I asked him about him. And Kamenetsky said, you know, he was the probably the best like driver on the team. Like he was the best guy at getting to the rim on the entire in the entire team. And then they gave me the butt, and we'll talk about that later. But that's where it fits. Is he can do something that the Mavericks desperately need. He has that skill set. And also Jason Kidd coached him with the Lakers. Like he was there. He was on the staff when Dennis Schroeder was was with the Lakers. And so that works either in his favor or not in his favor because he could have been he could have seen all the stuff he's seen behind the curtain. He's seen the nuts and bolts and said, I know what makes Dennis Schroeder tick. And what we want to build here in Dallas does not include somebody like that. And so then you see the, the negatives of it. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. I mean, not only the 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 connection with Jason Kidd, he knows what he's getting. He could probably figure out a way to um trying to word this right but temper him i guess and make sure that he's you know within his bounds and he's not going to be a cancer of the locker room because i think that's probably the biggest risk with signing someone like dennis Schroeder. like you said i mean he just does everything for the most part near an average level i think the shooting really needs help uh, he's kind of like I, I trust him to shoot at the top of the key outside of that i really don't want him shooting threes but yeah the Mavs, I mean, how many times have we said it over the last year? They need more slashers. Even after the the Spencer Dinwiddie trade, they need more guys that can easily get to the rim and draw fouls. And Dennis Schroeder will do just that. Like He was about an average finisher at the rim, slightly below average. For a guard, he was roughly right there. And he, I mean, he draws fouls. Like he's always going to be good for three a game. Like that's consistently been his number three free throw attempts a game. And that doesn't include the fouls drawn elsewhere that aren't shooting fouls. Yeah, he's he's he would be great Spencer Dinwiddie insurance as a player, right? Like on the court, if I'm going to borrow the harp colloquialism, like as as a player, he would he would like bring a lot of Dennis Schroeder insurance or, or uh, Spencer Dinwiddie insurance because he does some of the similar things. Now he's smaller than Spencer Dinwiddie, and his defensive, I guess, upside is definitely not as much as Spencer Dinwiddie um, because because of that size, uh, and he's just not going to defend anyway. But you. But with that kind of player, you don't necessarily even care about that at that position. You're wanting that per- that player to be an offensive con- an initiator, to be you know somebody that can just give you some buckets because they're going to need some buckets in certain moments, uh, or just insurance for Luca or Dinwiddie or one of those guys because they're the only two real ball handlers on the team, right? I, I, even even Mark Stein in his in his uh in his rumor was like you know the Mavericks are thinking about whether they should keep that 15th spot open so that they can give some opportunity to Frank Nilakina, Josh Green, Tyler Dorsey, who's playing really well. Like even, you know, J- Jaden Hardy wasn't mentioned in this, but uh, Greg St. Jean even mentioned Jaden Hardy to us when we were talking about if they need another ball handler. So he's definitely a better option than those guys, but the Mavericks may want to keep those options open. And uh, to keep those options open and not sign Schroeder is a bad sign for what Dennis Schroeder could bring to a team, right? Because there's a reason he hasn't signed with anybody yet. Yeah, and, you know, I think you bring up a good point. I forgot that Jaden Hardy, I, I, sometimes I just forget the depth of this team. Well, um, well I was when, thinking, when there's a draft, like when the draft is done, it just completely goes out of your mind and you focus on the next one. Like watching, Exactly. So I just kind of Raphael forget. work is pretty funny in that sense. You're like, I'm done with Raphael, like two days before the draft. I was like, I'm so done with this draft and I'm ready to move on to the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it doesn't even have anything to do with, I mean, like, I just – straight up forgot because i'm looking at the, like mavs last season roster and i'm like okay i know they added christian wood and whatever yeah. so i'm trying to like subtract and then i'm like oh wait they did they added a draft pick but <laughs> you know i would rather personally have dennis Schroeder be your third point guard uh including luca and spencer dinwiddie over somebody who was an inefficient guard in the g league who didn't create a ton for others i mean just you look at an NBA ready, like the difference between an NBA journeyman yeah. and someone like that, it, it is stunning. Like obviously Jaden Hardy's trajectory is hopefully up, whereas Schroeder's is kind of flat or declining in a way, but he's still young. Um, you look at the assists. I, I just, I'm going to use a harp uh, line as well at this juncture in the off <laughs> yes, season. Yes. <laughs> like what, what are you going to find better? Cause other people, you know, a lot of people are like, Oh, well you could trade, but it's like, what do the Mavs have? Because yeah. Josh Green is probably their best trade asset right now. That's a young player, I would argue. Um, I mean, I guess Luca technically, but well, like, yeah, Luca obviously. But I don't like, think they're moving like him or <laughs> Hardy or like I don't know Dorian maybe. But like none of these guys are moving. Dorian can't even be traded. I don't think for a year. So like, what are you going to do with these guys if yeah. you move any of the rotation players? You automatically are taking a drop off. So you almost have to resort to signing. And then, I mean, really good option is potentially even just building his value back up, right? Like 
the same way in, I mean, baseball, that's a common thing is signing these guys when your deals trade them at the trade deadline. Even if you're like a winning team, they'll sometimes dump them. Maybe that's what happens with Schroeder. I think it's just a good investment personally to sign him. And he's well, still under 30. Some people have even said that that's what the Mavs might do with Christian Wood, right? So that's yeah. that's the thing that takes me to this next thing is why wouldn't the Mavericks do this? And why haven't they done it so far? I've talked about this a little yesterday, but I think we need to talk about it a little more. Why have the Mavericks not signed Dennis Schroeder? Because it's such an easy, like, yes, if if you look at the what the Mavericks need and what he could bring talent-wise, why did it not work out? I asked a bunch of guys that used to cover him, and they will give me the, the whole lowdown, and we'll talk about it with Richard coming up. But before we do, let me tell you about Built Bar. It's a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar. They're absolutely delicious. Uh, I eat them all the time. They're, they're so good. The brownie batter puff is my favorite. It's a protein bar with like marshmallow fluff in the middle of it. 100% chocolate around the outside, 140 calories, 17 grams of protein, 7 grams of sugar. They have a ton of different flavors. They're like always coming out in new flavors. Strawberry came back. Cougar Tail is the new one. It's the BYU flavor. Uh, Richard, if you had to guess what a BYU flavored Built Bar would be, like what flavor do you think a BYU bar would be? Look, uh, you know, I don't know. I've actually been to BYU before. Uh, and let me just say they got killer food. So it's something tasty. That's all I got. <laughs> it's, it looks like it's got caramel in it, cocoa butter. I'm just looking at the ingredients. <laughs> uh, but yeah, natural vanilla. Okay, so there's some vanilla in there. So anyway, it's like a mystery flavor. But you can check that one out. Check out all the other ones. Use the promo code Locked On 15. That's Locked On the number one five. It's built.com. Again, Locked On 15 to get 15 percent off your entire order. All right, Richard, we're continuing our talk about Dennis Schroeder. You gave me the this is why they should do it, right? And and I would agree with you on a certain level. But then you take it to that next level and say, all right, why has he not been signed yet? Why, why is he still floating around? A guy that was so good for OKC that year when he was coming off the bench, playing with Chris Paul, Shea Gilgis Alexander. He started all those games for the Lakers. That Lakers team that made the playoffs and lost in the first round of the Suns, played in the, you know, the uh, and then he was with the the Celtics last year, the beginning of the year, averaged 14 and four off the bench. Like seemed like he was producing, but just it seemed like every Celtics person was just ready to get him off the team at any given turn. And so I went back and asked some people. I was like, "Okay, hey, what's the deal with with Dennis Schroeder?" And so I asked the Kamenetsky brothers, locked on Lakers, and they said, "You know, the he, Brian Kamenetsky said the two questions I'd ask is, what do you want him to do, and how important do you need him to be?" Not sure I would re, I would be in the relying on Dennis Schroeder business at this at this juncture if we're going to bring back the harp the harpism. Uh, so Richard, answer those two questions. What do you want him to do and how important do the Mavericks, would they need him to be if they've just brought him in right now? I think the answer will kind of overlap. I mean, I just want him to be a, a facilitator connecting guy, somebody who can have the ball in his hands, get to the rim. Like we talked about before also be able to just find shooters and off ball movers, right? Like find cutters. Cause yeah. while Luka Doncic does that, I think. Um, a lot of times it's set players or, or just straight up pick and rolls is where he finds, he finds, you know, he's double teamed in the right wing, kicks it out to the left corner. Boom. Dorian's open for three or Maxi Kleba off a double pick and roll, or he's going to the lane pick and roll. Whereas Dennis Schroeder, I, I just, I personally don't feel like Luca looks nearly as much as a lot of other guards for guys coming off of screens, uh, off ball. And I think that would be something, I mean, that's a lot of what Dennis Schroeder has been doing in Europe for Eurobasket and World Cup qualifiers, especially with Franz Wagner. I mean, my goodness, like Franz is one of the best at that. And that is like a match made in heaven for that. That's why his assist to turnover ratio is over two. He has 55 assists, 25 turnovers in, in both of those events. And Franz plays a big part of it. You look at how he finds those guys off ball. I just want him to get assists. Like at some day, like at some point, you know, a lot of people say like, oh, the stats and eye test, like a lot of times they don't match up. Sometimes just getting assists really does make the team better. It's really not that complicated a lot of times. <laughs> well, when you get an assist, you score as well. So, right? Exactly. So if he's if he's able to, even if it's not like, he doesn't have to be threading the needle every, every play, just like, hey, keep the ball flowing and it helps the movement of the offense. I think uh, for the last few years, we've seen a lot of stagnated offense where guys are, just sitting waiting for Luca to do something. Yeah, I think it, uh, it you know, kind of uh, motivates everybody else off ball to be active, and I, I, I like that. So I asked John Corrales, Locked On Celtics host, about Dennis Schroeder last year, and I and every time I checked in on Locked On Celtics and listened to him, he would talk about, oh, Dennis Schroeder is just holding up the offense and he's just doing this. So I asked him about it, and I said, what's the, give me the quick explainer on on Schroeder, and he said, slow, didn't push the ball, 
ball dominant. He was also the best penetrator, but he was also kind of going for his own too often. And here's the thing, right? You want him to be going for those stats because you want him to produce, but you also don't want him to go too far to where he's, all right, I'm in a contract here. I turned down that 75, 80, 90 million dollar deal that the Lakers offered me, and I want to recoup that in some way. So now you're in a, dealing with a guy in a contract here that would have the ball in his hands and have the opportunity to break off from the offense, to do his own thing, to play, to go rogue. And it seemed like he was doing that with the Celtics, and he would just go for his own stats. And you know he he can do stuff on the court. He can he's the best penetrator on the on the Celtics. What John Carlos said, like that's a big compliment. But when you're just doing that and just pushing for your own too often, it takes away from the team and it takes away from the two words that Jason Kidd wanted the Mavericks to be all about last year was chemistry and accountability. Those are two things that made the Mavericks who they are and made the Mavericks a team that made the Western Conference Finals last year. And so that's what you're deciding. All right, can we take a risk with Christian Wood? We feel like we can. We'll trade. We'll trade our first round pick. We'll trade all these, you know, expiring contracts, and we'll bring in Christian Wood. We feel like we're good with that. Him in a contract year. Now you're going to do it twice with with Dennis Schroeder too. Like, how much are you willing to to bet on the infrastructure that the Mavericks just set last year? They just got that set. They lost Brunson, who was a guy that kind of. You know, held some of that was the glue that kind of held some of that together. They still have glue pieces, right? Obviously, Dwight Powell and Dorian Finney Smith and uh, Reggie Bullock has kind of become that. Like they're they're glue guys on the team for sure. But are you willing to take that risk with two different guys now if you bring in Schroeder? And I think that's the question the Mavericks are answering. And at this point, the answer's been no. We're not wanting to do that. Yeah, that's where the kind of you have to draw the line, right? Because you do want somebody who's good but not explosive and a risk to just the chemistry and falling apart. You need somebody who's going to keep everything afloat and not a risk to sink the boat and throw everybody out the window, you know, with them or keep them on the boat locked in kind of thing. And, uh, or, and I guess in this case, locked on, am I right? Oh, uh, but, <laughs> no, no, no but, Richard. <laughs> Satnam shame. <laughs> but like, that's the, that's the hard part with, uh, with Dennis is like, yeah, you do want him to get his stats, but you also don't want him to be this guy who, he is stat chasing because in a way, in a way, he kind of has become that over the last couple couple seasons. I mean, the Houston stuff. I'm not going to blame him. He was traded there, but like he totally was out there to get his own assist. I mean, like it's not his fault he got traded of all places to Houston for yeah. Daniel Tice. Like that's that's not his fault. I'm sure he would have been a lot different. But the funny at thing the is, same time, can, can he go for himself with? helping the team long term also looking out for himself the funny thing about houston is that jackson gatlin locked on rockets host said that he was surprisingly good that he was like surprised about dennis Schroeder and how good he was and like what he brought to the team and i found that really interesting that the two different perspectives of the celtics host that's like all right this is a team that expects to win and, and eventually went to the finals and the rockets team like all right these are our expectations go out there and have some fun like we, we don't really even have a defensive plan necessarily and that that jackson was like oh Schroeder was surprisingly good so i think that's the that's the two sides of this if, if the mavericks were a team that all right we just need contributors just need anybody just need somebody to come in and help us in this arms race then yeah you'd go for Schroeder. and i kind of think they should take the risk if they feel if they feel like they can take it because they need they need that player they need that skill set but you're also needing to build something and have an infrastructure and your chemistry and like all that stuff was a reason why you were so good last year. And on that end of it, I get why the Mavericks haven't done it yet. But this is this, by the way, this is all stemming from a, a report from Mark Stein from Tim McMahon that um, that Nico Harrison and Michael Finley were both, you know, courtside to watch um, France beat uh, Bosnia and her, her uh Herzegovina, I, I I got that one. I got the left on my second try there. Uh, they're they watching the, that game in Eurobasket. They were watching Dennis Schroeder, and that they are, you know, they've considered him and, and thought about him. What do you think about this other report that they are um, thinking about leaving the fifteenth roster spot open, like for in season flexibility, and then allowing guys like Nilakina, Josh Green, Tyler Dorsey, Jaden Hardy, like, all right, it's open. We got a guard spot open. One of you guys like fight for it and work for those minutes. Yeah, in theory, it sounds nice. Maybe, I mean, I just, I, I'm not a huge fan of that. I think it really doesn't make a difference. I'd rather get somebody who's proven himself because I feel like a lot of times you just end up with like a John, how do you say his name? John Clavel or whatever, Jiverson. No, I don't. I'll no, go with him. no, no, no. <laughs> Wow! How dare Dang, you? Two buzzers with in how, one segment. Oh my how, goodness! I'm I'm how, I, how dare you bring up his name to me? How dare you stand where he stood? Yeah, that, yeah, Jean Clavel. That was the uh, 
So Isaac and I, a couple years ago, we always do these like board bets where we bet like, all right, who's going to last longer in training camp? Who's going to, you know, these things. And it was, um, I was, uh, PJ Dozier versus John Clavel. That was the two guys we, and I picked John Clavel and he picked PJ Dozier and now PJ Dozier is still in the league and, uh, John Clavel is not. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think the 15th spot, it's almost look, I, I would rather them trade before the season. I mean, I want them to get in on the, the whole Utah blowing oh, up sure. whether i mean any of those three guys clarkson conley or Boyan. um i prefer conley i really think they could sell him for second round picks and that's where the mavs benefit um they'll probably lose pal but like cool i, I think <laughs> i think i speak for a lot of uh mavs fans in saying this like i i, I think no mavs <laughs> fan is going to be like no not dwight Powell. you can't trade him like i've seen what i mean i'm sure dwight even knows the comments like i'm, I'm sure utah won't hate him <laughs> nearly as much so I personally, if they're going to make a trade or any of that flexibility, it's Conley. It's one of those three guys, preferably Conley, because that's a lot better than Dennis Schroeder. You get a lot of the similarities without any risk to chemistry. He's also like been known to be one of the best guys in the NBA. Like His first flagrant was this year of his career. So <laughs> I, I think that's the best choice. But again, it takes two to tango. So yeah. if you're just leaving it open, you're really going to get somebody that quality? I don't think so. Takes two to tango, which is an interesting way to segue into this next thing. Dennis Schroeder has to choose the Mavs too. So coming up, let's talk about his side of it. What are what could the Mavs offer him that would make him want to come to Dallas? And then Mark Stein mentioned a couple other guys as well. Eric Bledsoe, Alfred Payton, a couple others that the Mavericks could be targeting as well. Let's talk about those guys coming up. All right, Richard, we're continuing to talk about Dennis Schroeder. The Mavericks' 15th roster spot is open. They need another guard. They've been trying to figure out who it is. They were reportedly, you know what? hanging out and watching Dennis Schroeder play for Germany and Eurobasket. And Dennis Schroeder has to choose the Mavs too. This is a whole other part of it. And this is the thing that drives me and Isaac the craziest during free agency. Why did the Mavericks not get like Jaden or uh, Jay Crowder? Why couldn't they have gone to get this guy and got, why did they get this guy? Well, the, the player has to choose the team too. Like the players have the most agency that they've had in a long time in the NBA guys like, uh, Cam Reddish are like asking for trades now. That didn't used to happen where a guy like on that level was asking for a trade. And so now like Dennis Schroeder has to choose the Mavericks too. It happened with Goran Dragic. Dragic has to choose the Mavs as well. The Mavs offered him a certain you know role, whether it was his, you know, what, what Dragic said was like a f- every five days type uh, player or, or role or something like that off the bench. Uh, whether it was that or not, they offered him some kind of deal. He didn't want it, and then they, he moved on and went to Chicago where they lied to him and said that they, they have 20 to 25 minutes for him off the bench, which I don't see, and our Lockdown Bulls guys don't see for him either. But Dennis Schroeder has to choose the Mavs, and I don't know if he wants to be a guy that, hey, come in, play in our play in our system, chemistry, accountability, like this is what you're going to get. There would be some nights you're probably not going to play because we have so many guys. Like I don't think he's going to be down for that, and that would be that would be – the same kind of like pitch that you'd have to make for for me and probably Jason Kidd and the Mavericks to be down with bringing him in is not a pitch that's going to appeal to to Dennis Schroeder, I don't think. Yeah, and I completely agree. It's something where you remember when this is my favorite Mavs team, the 2013-14 team, where Brandon Wright, um, bear with me because I'm about to go through some names, Dewan Blair and yep. and Sleepy Sam Dallenbear. They all three. <laughs> I feel like there's something coming my way. No, I just I just hit the. I just, oh, okay. I just, thought I heard something. Just for so, the names. All three of them, um, they had to. It was some nights one of them wouldn't play. Even Brandon Wright was getting DNPs, and would Dennis Schroeder accept that? Also, one of, and I don't think he would personally. No. Also, one of, especially on a one-year deal, prove it deal. No way. Which is, I think, ultimately a fatal flaw for him. But also, like I've seen a lot of people. This is a little bit of side tangent. I've seen a lot of people compare. Oh, we could have had Goran Dragic instead of him. At this point, like maybe I'm just looking way too much of this in the regular season lens. Availability matters. Like Goron playing once every, like pretty much twice a week versus Dennis playing every single, like, I mean, 70 games. It's a difference. Like, I would safely take Dennis on that. Like, if it came down to the two, give me Dennis. I don't, I don't care if the playoff difference is slightly better. At some point, you got to get there, too. One thing I, I'm going to put on here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on my conspiracy. I think there's a chance. There's my conspiracy music. I think there's a chance the Mavericks already have a deal agreed with Schroeder that they were there to see him to like support him. And that's why they were there because like 
they're not scouting him. Like, let's be honest. They're not scouting him in Europe. They know what they're getting. They know what they're getting with Dennis Schroeder. They watched him. They played against him. Like, they've seen enough of him. Like, they know. They're not going to Eurobasket to, like, sit courtside for Dennis Schroeder to, like, go watch him. They know what they're getting. But they are there to support him because they have a deal in place in case this Jazz stuff doesn't go through. If the Jazz stuff doesn't go through, like, all right, we don't get Conley. We don't get Boyan. We don't get Clarkson. For some reason, all that stuff doesn't work out. The Durant stuff already fell through, so we're not getting anybody from that. Then we bring in Schroeder, and that's my conspiracy theory. That's my conspiracy theory about Dennis Schroeder. They already have a deal in place. They're just waiting for, they're just waiting for the Jazz stuff still to to fall through. And I don't think that that stuff is. I don't even think that that stuff is going to ha- necessarily happen before the season. They the Jazz could yeah. just wait on those guys. They don't have any, They got nothing but time. I listened to the David Locke after the, the Mitchell trade, and he's like. When's the next time the Mavs are going to be relevant again? And he's like, all right. Well, four years from now, we'll be these these draft picks will be in play. And he's, he's like going through like four or five years from now, they're going to be relevant. So they have time with these guys to try and get the exact right trade and to wait through the year and pull an OKC and get like first rounders for them all. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, I doubt they went out there. To, I, I could see it. Uh, I doubt they went out there and they're like, you know what? I need to be sold on him. Let's watch Eurobasket. <laughs> Let and me like, see him you know, in a just... Germany jersey instead of okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he does in the national version, like with Franz Wagner. Like, yeah, I I'd love to believe that to be the case, but they have enough NBA intel on him. Like, I I could see something like that. I I think nothing formal on his end, but I think they they probably have connected for sure, saying, oh, hey, like yeah. we want Conley or whatever, but. In, in case that does fall through, would you be interested in being an insurance come training camp? What, you know, like in two weeks or like with, I think personally, I think not only will Dennis Schroeder sign by next Monday, I'm forgetting what day it is. Um, I keep Monday. thinking like that the week started two days ago. So um, like, I think personally, I think he's going to sign by the middle of like again next week. And also I think Conley will be the first traded. And I think, I'll, I think all of it's going to happen pretty quick before training camp. Mm. I'm I'm down for that. I'm ready for it. And I hope the Mavericks get one of those guys because they still do have a need. Let's not forget in all this, they still do have a need. And if they just don't feel good about Dennis Schroeder's vibes and they don't bring him in, then could be another could be another missed opportunity. Here's some other ones that the Mavericks uh, could other players the Mavs could uh, look at as well. These are available backcourt free agents for Dallas to consider. I don't think Mark Stein was saying that these guys like the Mavericks are even looking at these guys, but. He mentioned their names, and so there's there's probably a connection in some way. Maybe it's just the agent talking to Stein and saying, like, hey, put our name out there so that maybe we get some look from some of these teams. But uh, Eric Bledsoe, Compazzo, Alfred Payton, and then former Mavs draftee Dennis Smith Jr. Let's just go through these names, starting with um, – let's just start with Dennis Smith Jr. Uh, what's your thoughts on him, how he's looked for Portland and some of these other teams, and uh, him as an option for the Mavericks? Yeah, no, he's not an option. Um, with all due respect – what's he done on a winning team to like, I, I just, I think at some point you got to close the door. Like why him? I've seen people say, Oh yes, yeah, the best upside, all this stuff. Is it realistic? Like is he even sniff back a point girl? Like I genuinely don't know if he's better than Jaden Hardy. That's my, that's my thing is like, if you're going to do that, if you're going to do that like with Dennis, with Dennis Smith jr. And we love Dennis Smith jr. Loved covering him, like loved interacting with him as a person, but to bring him back in as a player, I'm like, I'd rather just give those min- whatever minutes we're going to go to, to Dennis Smith Jr., to Jaden Hardy, or to even to Frank Nilakin, or even Tyler Dorsey, who's like lighting it up for Greece right now and is an incredible shooter and at least brings one real like NBA skill on the court. And so at, at that point, I would rather go with this hodgepodge of these other guys that the Mavericks seem to be looking at right now if they don't sign anybody else. Uh, what are your thoughts about Eric Bledsoe? Also, pretty hard pass on him. Uh, that dude <laughs> is declining fast. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, for anybody who watched him in New Orleans, it was, it was, y'all remember, uh, do you remember the game um, in the playoffs? Eric Bledsoe, I I can't really paint the picture. I just remember Milwaukee had a chance to win against Boston. Dude made like one of the dumbest mistakes in the play. I can't remember these specifics, but like, it sounds on brand for him, right? It was every single play in New Orleans was that like his turnovers per game really, like, I don't know how the number is so well. He had 1.6 in 30 minutes a game, which sounds really good. But like the turnovers were not reflecting how terrible of a decision maker he was. I don't know why he had so much trust. He's just falling off in a lot. And then also this last year with the, with the Clippers never played for the Blazers or anything after the trade. Um, but like, uh, what did he do? I, I genuinely don't know. Like, I guess he's still okay on defense, 
what does he bring? Yeah, he's never been a shooter in the NBA. So you're like, all right, he's not bringing that to the team. He's a little undersized. And, but his athleticism, has, and especially strength, has been what's kept him in the NBA, right? That wingspan, all that stuff has kept him in the NBA. And he was a real contributor for that Bucks team a couple years ago and started a bunch of games for them, started in the playoffs and all that. But yeah, that decline for those small when we when we talk about small guards declining, and it's usually talked about with Chris Paul, and that doesn't happen because he's just an otherworldly athlete and player and all that. But when we talk about small guards declining, it's the Mike Conleys, it's the Eric Bledsoe's, it's the especially guys like that, uh, and Eric Bledsoe especially that relies on athleticism. That's when it goes down. And so I don't know. I would take a flyer on him and just try it and see what happens. But yeah, I I don't know. Like. Yeah, <laughs> he's, just, he's not answering the questions, right? I think Dennis Schroeder at least answers more questions, but he also comes with questions. He also comes with questions as far as off the court and things like that. Uh, thoughts on Compazzo, Facundo Compazzo? Ah, oh, man. See, this is the problem with like the 15th roster spot. Everyone has this like fatal flaw, right? So yeah. Compazzo is a nitty gritty kind of guy. I mean, we I think a lot of people got familiar with him a year ago when he was coming over to the NBA and then Denver ultimately signed him, or maybe it was even two years ago now. I yeah. can't remember, but pretty sure it's just one year ago. And yeah, he he's a guy who'll get in your face, but like also, my goodness, some of the decisions he makes on offense will make you just scratch your eyes out. <laughs> and his jump shot's not really there. I'm like uh, you know, for the 15th spot, I might I I'd I'd take him. I think I, I just I can't picture him making some of the same mistakes here. Granted, he played with with uh, Jokic. So that's probably one of the hardest places to, you know, screw up. And he still did. I don't know. I, <laughs> I'd still kind of pass, but I'm giving him more benefit of the doubt because he can, he doesn't give up on anything in the game. Yeah. He's not, he's not JJ Barea, right? Sometimes you look at him and you're like, all right, he's JJ Barea. Let's bring him in and do it. No, he's, he's not that right. He's slower. The defense is somehow even worse. <laughs> the size is the same. Passing is probably the same. And other than that, like JJ Barea was just so good at pick and roll and so good at navigating through like, you know, through traffic and things like that. And just composite composite just isn't that in the NBA. Um, and then Alfred Payton's the last one. And he just doesn't bring the skill set that the Mavericks want. Like he is, he's a guy that can play a little defense. He's got the wingspan. He's never had a shot. He's, you know, he doesn't bring the skill set that the Mavericks would want. He's been on enough teams by now for us to know that, uh, yeah, it's just not, it's just not going to work out in the NBA. Yeah. For he, he only took 20, um, 21 threes for the year last year and shot 24%. Well, I mean, on overall jump shots, he shot 27%. Yeah. yeah he's really good in the pick and roll and like, playmaking but you know what's coming that kind of takes away everything right if you know hey you don't have to worry about him doing anything other than layups and passing those guards you don't are, have to guard him on offense those guards are dead right like like the guys that you're seeing coming out in the draft like there are no guards that just can't shoot threes anymore where you're like oh there's a first round guy this guy's definitely going to be like it just seems like those guys don't exist anymore in theory um i think sometimes jump shots uh can be missed in scouting, I, I think generally for me, I'm like, hey, I'm not unless they're elite at defense and or passing. Like Dejounte Murray, somebody who he's never had a great jumper, sure, he got better. That's true, but like as a young player, he was like pure defense and he was pure passing. But the difference is like, Elver Payton had like, a, how do I wear this? He his his hair really just got in his way. Um, and as uh, and <laughs> even true, then, though, though, like like and I even though he's cut it a few times, I don't know, I, I, he doesn't have it now or anything, but like. Because of that, he missed. I, I really think that impacted his jump shooting development. It's crazy. Um, that's crazy. He just never got better as a shooter. And like at some point, hey, that door closes. Like this is a league where I think the average, uh, what the average age is twenty four years old or something like that, right? Mm, that's like, I don't sounds know. right. Yeah. I mean, the door closes, and he's well over 20, 24. I, I just, I, I think he's out of the league. This one, hoopsgeek.com says it's 26.1. That seems kind of old. 26 sounds right. It seems old to me. I heard it somewhere in the pre-draft process. Maybe it was uh maybe it was like average player, I don't know, like on the second contract. Certain or teams are like are way younger and way older. Like Oklahoma yeah. City last year was average 22.9. Oh my gosh, that's so yeah. And then the Lakers were 30 years. That was their average age. <laughs> 30, 30 years. <laughs> Insane. You can go check out Richard Stamen and all the draft guys over at NBA uh at Locked on NBA Big Board, where they're covering draft stuff all the time. I should know the name of your podcast. I like it. Literally, <laughs> it's my job. Um, and then you can go read his stuff on Mavs Draft. 
Uh, go follow him on Twitter at Mavs Draft. Great stuff. Also, go listen to Locked on NBA. Great stuff every single day. The biggest stories in 30 minutes with Locked on NBA, your daily NBA update. Again, in just 30 minutes. Guys, thanks so much for listening to Locked on, N- Locked on Mavs. Gosh. <laughs> Peace out. Boom.